Well, good afternoon and welcome to the U.S. Army's Facebook Live. From the Pentagon, I'm Hank Manitrez of the Army G1's office. And our topic this afternoon is the Army Combat Fitness Test, or the ACFT. It's a result of a culmination of a result of years of research in the Army's effort to optimize holistic health and fitness. And as the world's premier fighting force, it is absolutely imperative that we have cohesive teams filled with disciplined, highly skilled, talented, and most importantly, physically fit soldiers to bring our lethality to the next level. Individual readiness is the key to Army readiness, and that's what the ACFT is all about. Now, we've got a lot of questions that we've compiled over the last couple of days that you've sent in through various social media avenues. We appreciate that. We're going to try to get to as many of those as we can, and we invite you to type in your questions in the comment sections here on the uh, Facebook page. We've got a crack team of folks behind the scenes that'll send those questions up to me, and I will ask our panel members. So why don't we go ahead and introduce the panel now. First up is the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. Less than two months on the job, and he's already doing a Facebook Live on what is a very important topic. So SMA, I want to thank you for being here. Yeah, Next up is Command Sergeant Major Timothy Gooden. He is the Command Sergeant Major for the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, TRADOC. They oversee 32 schools in the Army under eight centers of excellence, each of them offering a different specialty. Our third panelist today is Command Sergeant Major Edward Mitchell. He is from the Center for Initial Military Training. And if ever there was an encyclopedia of the ACFT, it is this man right here. So gentlemen, I want to thank you three for being here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, the big Army announcement today. And what I'd like to do is just have each of you offer a couple minutes or 30 seconds of your own thoughts before we jump into the questions. SMA, why don't you take it away? Okay, thank you very much. And, uh... Thank uh, everybody on social media for joining us this afternoon. It is truly an honor to be the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army. But today we're talking about a fundamental shift in how we do our fitness culture. The Army Combat Fitness Test will improve our lethality and our readiness, and it's giving us highly trained, physically fit, and lethal squads for the future. Uh, it's six events that have significantly been validated over the last years, and it actually uh, assesses 10 components of fitness that mirror about 80% of the things that we are asked to do in combat. There's still a lot of work to be done over the next few years or the next year to finalize the number of tasks related to the Army Combat Fitness Test for record. Uh, the ACFT will affect about are about 60 Army regulations, so we still have a lot of work to do to make sure we get that information correct in the regulations. TRADOC and CIMT have worked hard to lead the proponents for the ACFT, and they are analyzing the data that we're gather gathering from the 63 battalions and from our initial military training soldiers to optimize the ACFT. Our Army has had to adapt to change throughout our history. Today, it's a positive step to, toward ensuring we have the best trained, highly disciplined force in the world. So thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, SMA. Sergeant Major Gooden. Good afternoon. Uh, right now, today, uh, TRADOC is preparing to move forward with uh, a 1 October of 2019 implementation of testing the ACFT in all courses that are within TRADOC. Uh, we'll primarily be doing this uh, in the in the basic training and the uh, OSUT entry level positions, but it'll also be done in the Bullocks uh, and also in the NCOS courses. Uh, we are doing this uh, primarily so that uh, after we finish this FY uh, FY 20 of basically a diagnostic test for everybody in the Army for all three compos, uh, the new soldiers that will be coming to your ranks. Uh, will have experienced and tested on the ACFT, and so they will have that experience. Um, another thing that uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, very briefly is about uh, some of the misconceptions that are out there. There's quite a few rumors and misconceptions that are going on out there. I hope, uh, I hope that, that uh, you take this opportunity with uh, the three of us up here to send in some questions that uh, we may be able to answer about some of those misconceptions. But some of the common ones that, uh, that I hear about often are uh, about can't, you can't start any training with it because you don't have any equipment. And we do realize that uh, we're still working on the equipment piece, but there is a lot of training that you can do uh, in preparation for the ACFT. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one would be just 
to uh, execute some of the PRT items that are in the manual, uh, starting with the uh, prep drill, you can do the conditioning drills, the climbing drill, the military movement drills, uh, and four for the core. A lot of those things will automatically help you get in the right frame of mind, a functional fitness type of mindset uh, when it comes to performing well in the ACFT. Um, another, another one of the uh, misconceptions out there is that uh, if I'm on profile, I'm gonna get kicked out of the Army. Uh, that is not true. Uh, you're not going to get kicked out of the Army if you're on profile. Uh, some of these things will be determined, uh, as the SMA said, uh, as we go through this year of collecting data for, the, for everybody in the Army. And uh, a lot of those Army policies will be, uh, decisions will be made on those, but uh, we are not going to kick everybody out of the Army that is on a profile. So uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, this should be fun. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major Mitchell, it's up to you now. Hey, thank you, sir. You know, um, first of all, what I'd like to say, thank you for having me here at SMA and Sergeant Major Gooden. But what I want to talk about is holistic health and fitness. The ACFT is only one small component of the holistic health and fitness, which is a comprehensive, integrated, immersive health fitness system that generates lethal soldiers who are physically ready and mentally tough to go and guess what? Take care of our enemy on the modern day battlefield in the multi domain environment. However, this overarching concept framework encompasses all aspects of the human performance, sleep, injury prevention, and nutrition, to optimize a soldier's individual readiness. You know, we're going to do this through five different systems under, under this um, holistic health and fitness. You got governance, where we actually sit down, have we track, monitor, and assess soldiers in progress. We also look at programs, how we coach, teach, and mentor the soldiers, and rehabilitate those soldiers. Then we look at the facilities and the equipment. You know, we do a lot of things across the army to where we give all of our soldiers equipment and stuff to go out there and train and fight and go take care of the enemy. But we don't give them the equipment and stuff we need for them to take care of their body. So that's something we're looking at on the holistic health and fitness to give them that, fit, that uh, equipment and the equipment they need and that facility just like a training range where they can go, sign, get in there, and make sure they are physically fit. And then the personnel. We're looking at what personnel do you need in order for to make sure that you have it at the need of where you're at. For instance, if a soldier gets injured when they're down at a battalion level, do they have that strength trainer or that dietitian or the behavior health specialist that's sitting there waiting, ready to take that individual and get that, that person back into the fight? That's what we want. We want them on the field. We don't need them on the sideline. And the last thing is how we educate them. You know, we want to make sure that we educate them through the whole entire education system. No matter if you're a warrant officer, officer or a soldier, that all the way through your educational system when you, as you go through the military, you would have that. So basically, it is a life cycle system that develops and improves every soldier's readiness. But we do this from pre-accession pre training all the way through their army career as well as to the soldier for life. So bottom line up front, we don't need soldiers on the sideline. We need them on the field. We need you in the game. And the way you get into the game, it's about getting him, making sure we do this ACFT and change the culture. Thank you. Cool. Well, gentlemen, thanks for your opening comments. I say we get right to these questions. We got a lot. A um, couple of the main ones that keep coming up. On average, how long is it taking units to complete the ACFT, and what are the approved alternate events and standards for each? I'll go ahead and uh, talk about the uh, approved alternate events, and I'll let Sergeant Major Mitchell talk about the, uh, the standard times that it's taken for units to uh, accomplish the ACFT administer it. Uh, the approved alternate events uh, right now are the swim, the bike, and the, uh, the swim, the row, and the bike. Uh, each of those are approved to be uh, alternate events for the two mile run. Uh, each of those uh, events uh, have to be completed within 25 minutes, and the distances vary between the three events. For the swim, you have to complete 1,000 meters within 25 minutes. For the row, you have to be able to complete 5,000 meters in 25 minutes. And for the bike, you have to be able to complete 15,000 meters in, in uh, 25 minutes. Now, here's what I will tell you, is that the, the idea of the alternate events uh, was, was mostly uh, developed with the mindset that uh, these weren't not going to be a cakewalk, uh, that you were going to have to work hard at these, just like you have to work hard on everything else with the ACFT. Uh, it's imperative that uh, you, uh, you know, for instance, a soldier just doesn't uh, roll out of bed in the morning uh, thinking that they got to take the ACFT and, uh, um, and they're going to borrow somebody's bike and go jump on it and uh, knock out 15,000 meters uh, on, a, on a bike ride because that's not going to happen. 
uh, you will fail it if that's the way if that's the preparation and the mindset that you have into this. The same thing goes within the pool and the water, uh, and the same thing goes with the row. Uh, I very routinely use the row as a uh, as a heart rate uh, conditioner in between some of my exercises, and usually I'm trying to hit uh, 500 meters as fast as I can. That's 500 meters. This is 5,000 meters in 25 minutes, and so. This isn't something that uh, soldiers should look at and take uh, lightly if they, if they are on permanent profile and they're going to be taking one of these alternate events for the two-mile run. This is something that they have to work at and they have to prepare for. Uh, the idea was that uh, these events would be uh, just as difficult or more difficult to complete than the actual two-mile run itself. Uh, so if a soldier does have a, a, a permanent profile and they cannot uh, perform any part of the two-mile run uh, that they would possibly consider doing the two-mile two mile run and walk at their own pace, run at their own pace to get the two miles complete uh, because these other, these other three exercises are going to be pretty tough. Again, you have to be able to work at those. Um, and uh, again, you know, the pool and the bike, that's, that's not anything that you can just uh, assume that you're going to be like on vacation and go and execute, uh, you know, having a good time on a bike and, and swimming in the pool. You have to work at these things. We got some of our, uh, some of our uh, senior leaders in the Army who are uh, pretty good at swimming in the pool, uh, and they did it during college and, uh, and, and other competitive arenas uh, in their lifetime, and uh, it's, it's tough for them. So this is going to be something that uh, soldiers are going to have to understand. Now is the time to get out there and start practicing on these things and start working on these things. And that's to include all the events of the ACFT, not just necessarily the alternate events, but specifically the alternate events also if you fall into one of those categories. And I'll pass it on to Sergeant Major Mitchell for the, uh, the second part of that question. Um, the second part of the question was, uh, how long does it take you to actually go through um, and complete this test? Not counting the prep drill or the cool down, you're looking at a roughly about 35 to 35, 36 minutes of actual exercise time that you'll be doing with about 16 minutes of rest time in between it. Because you're going to look at it, when you start doing each one of these exercises, there's going to be a greater and four soldiers that's going to be going through it at one time. And it's actually based upon so every soldier can get the rest they need between each one of those exercises before they begin the next one. So if you look at it all together, it's about 51 minutes to actually to complete the entire exercise. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's talk about equipment right now. That's another big question out there, um, especially with the Guard and Reserve. How are we going to distribute the equipment among those units and also the smaller installations? How are we going to field equipment uh, with the smaller installations? Okay. I'll start off with the equipment for the Guard and Reserves. So we've had this conversation as well, is it going to be at the reserve centers, at all the reserve centers, all the way down to Cutby Battery Troop? Um, we have to, we've got a long way to go to figure out what is the sweet spot in the right areas for that. It's like the regulations. We don't, we don't have the answers. That's why we have to start on 1 October to get some of the decision space to say where do we have the right mix at the equipment at the right locations to make sure that it doesn't hurt our compo two and three. And as we get the equipment, we're gonna push that out. We had seven, we have seven battalions in the Guard and Reserves that are actually testing right now. So that they have the equipment, they're going through, and that's gonna inform us on how much equipment that we're gonna need in each, each location. We don't have the perfect mix because uh, it's gonna be one per state, it's gonna be somewhere else, so we're still, working through to get the right exact number of equipment for our compo two and three. Yeah. So, if you mind, I just want to add one piece onto that. When we started this right here last year, I had two sergeant majors that actually works in my, it worked in my headquarters. Michael Schultz, who used to be the USAR sergeant major, and we have Sergeant Major Rogers, who is a National Guard sergeant major. Both of them works in my headquarters. And as we was coming up with these plans of how we were going to integrate compo two and three into this, we actually had them go out and talk to every last one of their counterparts across the entire army for the, from Compo 2 and 3 and came back with their concerns as we was looking at how we was going to implement those with them seven battalions that we have in each one. So we had somebody in our headquarters at this whole time to make sure we was doing it and had all three Compos in mind at this. Uh, I'll add something uh, with the equipment. So the, the, the basis of issue for uh, the ACFT equipment that's required for the test is uh, 16 lanes of equipment per battalion headquarters. Um, obviously, not everybody has that right now, and uh, we, as the SMA stated, we still have uh, this, 
this year to figure out exactly what is going to be the sweet spot and where they're put at. But I will tell you this is that a lot of this is going to come down to uh, commander's decision, geographical locations, and the actual missions of certain units and where they're at. Um, at the Army senior leadership cannot come out with a cookie cutter uh, policy on how the equipment gets distributed within those organizations because that may not fit for every type of organization. Even within TRADOC, we have we have COMPO 2 and COMPO 3 like elements when we talk about uh, U.S. Army Cadet Command and U.S. Army Recruiting Command as we've got small, in, small uh, groups of soldiers that are out there all over the place and they don't necessarily fall under a uh, ni nice and, and neat uh, battalion footprint. And so we have to figure out exactly where these lanes of equipment are going to be dispersed and you, you may not have all 16 lanes uh, assembled at a battalion headquarters, wherever that battalion headquarters is at. Uh, they may be dispersed uh, however the battalion commander uh, and the CSM feel that it's uh, best fit for soldiers to execute and use and train on those, that, those uh, items of equipment. All right, our next question is, comes right off of our Facebook live feed. Um, how will soldiers do a 30, 60, and 90-day ACFT prior to NCO? Yes, when setting up different equipment is required, considering it's onesies and twosies that need to test at different times depending on school locations. Um, uh, first of all, that is not a, it's not a TRADOC requirement. That is not an Army requirement to do the 30, 60, 90 day APFT prior to a professional military education school, NCOPDS. So that's a unit requirement that units are putting on them. Uh, the, the requirement is uh, you're, you're going to have to pass the, the ACFT at the NCO PDS, and that is the requirement. If units want to do that 30, 60, 90 days, that's a, that'll be a unit responsibility to determine how that will be uh, implemented. Well, thanks, SMA. What is the plan to revamp postpartum timelines? Okay. And I know that was going to come up. We knew it was coming. Yeah. Uh, I've received this question three times probably in the last week uh, as a Sergeant Major of the Army. So that's a, the good news is that's we actually need the time. Again, we're going to start this on 1 October to determine exactly what those policies are going to be. There's 60 policies that we need to look at and maybe we need to check, change. However, we still have to do the analysis. When you're on a temporary profile, the current policy is that depending on the type of profile, as long as you, if it's for promotion points, if you look at the promotion reg, you, you could get all the way up to two years, depending on the type of profile that you're on, that your promotion points would be valid as long as you have a PT test in that last 24 months. So in other words, I take an APFT, if for some reason you become pregnant, you get your nine months and then six months Right now, uh, it's still going to be six months, but we still have a year to actually determine what is that going to be. Does that regulation stay the same? It's just like the, the standards have changed. Even in the last year, we looked at what we were going to start with, and we've made adjustments based off the data that we received. We're going to make adjustments again until we get to October of next year because we need the time to see, do we have the right timeline? Currently, the policy is six months. I'm not sure that needs to go longer or not until we do the data analysis to see. And the, the, the other question is, well, you know, it was really hard to, to meet those timelines when it was the APFT. But we haven't given you the enablers. We haven't trained for this. And we haven't, some people haven't even taken the ACFT yet. So we may be, some people may be able to do it four months, five months, but we're going to need, we need the time to get the analysis right. The current policy is in effect. You get six months. If we need to adjust that, I think the statistical data will help inform us on whether we need to extend that or not. Anyone else want to weigh in on that or are we good to go? No, oh, that's good. I think I mean, we just need more data. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And that's what this new validation phase that we're entering is all about, is collecting more data to see where we need to shape this and make adjustments. 
Uh, next question offline is, uh, will the screening table for the height, weight, and body composition be reevaluated? <laughs> I would imagine it's the same answer. We're still looking at these things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. We have concurrence across the table, so that's well, the answer. We're still looking at these things. <laughs> the Army Combat Fitness Test is, is, first of all, it's very good for the Army and something that we need to do, um, which is, like Sergeant Major Mitchell said, we need to look at the holistic health and fitness and how are we going to be highly trained, disciplined, and fit soldiers. And it's not just about the activity that we do. It's also about the nutrition that we eat. So as we look at the Army Combat Fitness Test, the Army Body Composition Program is in correlation with that. Um, that's the second piece is am I in the right health? in my, my fitness in the weight that I carry. So we've always looked at what we're going to do to the Army body composition. And I don't, it's not necessarily tied to the Army combat fitness test right now. It's just like we've always looked at, do we have the right mix of body weight versus how I take? That, that question is always available, and it's always been reassessed or assessed. It's come up in the past years, and it's not actually tied to the Army Combat Fitness Test. SME, do we have any numbers on the amount or percentage of injuries and profiles that resulted over the last year of the testing phase? Did you guys collect any of that data? Uh, I, I'll turn it over for the, this data, but I will go back to what we were looking at from the Forces Command. And what we found is as we looked at giving the proper enablers and doing the exercises properly, we've seen muscular skeletal injuries go down when we looked at what we were doing for what was called the soldier readiness test, which is not the Army Combat Fitness Test. That's why what Sergeant Major Mitchell was saying, how important it is to get some of the, the exercises done correctly um, and, and how you do the exercises and giving you some of the, the enablers where you have a di registered dietitian you have an occupational therapist or you have a strength and conditioning coach, someone that can guide you through this. And that's why that other data is still important too. Some of the folks don't even have those, those things that we've given to those 63 battalions. So when you look at doing those, you may get stronger and you might find out because you've got some of the enablers, you, you can do this test actually easier because you got somebody to guide you with it that's been a resident expert. But I'll give it over to the the data from the CIMT. Well, as of right now, of the hundred of the 63 battalions we have been testing all the way up to today, there has been no one injured or had a profile coming off of taking the ACFT as of right now, not one person. So what I will tell you is it's because, you know, we do have five, we got 16 MTT teams that goes around, mobile training teams that goes around that train the 63 battalions that we have out there on the ACFT as well as training the rest of the Army. And what their goal were was to go out there and show them, just like the SMA said, the standard. How you need to do it, how you need to execute it, and how you need to take this right here. And once they made sure that all of the levels three, two, and ones was trained, guess what? That's why we have not seen any injuries or profile that came from it today. That's outstanding news, and I guess the next question kind of leads right into what you both have already talked about, and that is what are the plans to help soldiers build up the ACFT? Uh, what types of drills might, train, uh, might change in, in leading up to that? Uh, I'll start off, uh, and, and I know that both the SMA and Sergeant Major Mitchell probably have quite a bit of information also, but, you know, I, I talked about this initially with my uh, opening comments, and um, I remember, I say this quite oftenly when I'm in groups and I'm talking to them, but I, I do remember I was a brigade sergeant major when PRT was introduced to the Army in 2009. And I will tell you that it was not received well throughout the Army. Uh, and I would, I would tell you, and this is my personal opinion, I would tell you that as a result of that, uh, we have soldiers in the Army today that are not properly equipped uh, physically uh, to take the ACFT uh, with confidence that they're going to do well on it. And primarily, most of that comes from uh, a lack of attention to the core uh, of our bodies, because as it is with the APFT, uh, a, a sit-up is not necessarily a, a great a test event to measure out your core strength. It might be able to tell how fast you can move up and down uh, in, a, in, a, in a supine position, but it doesn't necessarily determine your core strength. Um, what I will tell you is that uh, in, in at least the first five events of the ACFT, 
uh, whether you're realizing it or not, if you're not engaging your core, uh, then you're probably going to get lower back pain and upper back pain and leg pain and that kind of those kinds of things that are going to be minor ailments. Um, but you know, proper. You know, I will tell you that there's lots of exercises out there. A lot of it, really, your imagination is is uh, only. Uh, is, is the only thing that's going to limit you to what you can do. I, I've seen all kinds of incredible ideas out there as I'm going around uh, what soldiers have, have put together, uh, things that they can do uh, eat with, with or without pull-up bars, with or without uh, drag bags, uh, with or without uh, hex bars, uh, any of the actual equipment. There's still a lot of good training that you can do to uh, work on preparing yourself for the ACFT. And that's that's also why I said let's let's not just wait for the equipment. Let's start getting our, using our imagination. Let's start getting after it. Uh, you know, you can keep with the military mindset and use ammo crates and ammo cans and sandbags and uh, skid coes and that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of other stuff that you can do also. I saw I saw the other day uh, in place of the drag bag, I saw uh, just a, a standard rope that was pulling uh, two 45-pound uh, kettlebells around. Uh, which came up to the 90 pounds, and that's that's going to get you. What you really need to do is you need to get in the practice of doing that backwards run when it comes to the uh, the sprint drag carry piece of it. Um, that's what I see. That the last the last 25 meters of the uh, sprint drag carry is what seems to break off a lot of people because they can get the first half done, they turn around and it's really hard, slow going to get back. Uh, but yeah, again, lean lean forward, start doing those things, and start working. Your body is going to be sore a good sore when you start doing these things because you're working muscle groups and parts of your body that you haven't touched before. Uh, so don't wait for the scheduled ACFT. Uh, that's gonna be a diagnostic for everybody during FY20. Don't wait for that to come around before you uh, experiment and start training on some of these things. Well, gentlemen, over the last couple of days, the next question has come up quite a bit so with regard to the pass fail rate and the, and the data we've, that we've collected over the last year. Uh, particularly with the fail rate, uh, did, did you see anything in there that might make you want to change uh, the scoring standard for any of the events? I'll, I'll, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll address this a little bit of the pass fail, but and I'll, I'll use this as an example of what we've done in the past with the, the, the current APFT. We've adjusted the scale for the current APFT since I have been in the military. Granted that I've been in the military for a couple of days, uh, a little bit, but we've we've adjusted those scales, and I go go back to we've adjusted the scale in the last year, and that's it's got to be an informed decision on what we're going to do. So originally, at some point, uh, what you don't really know is that we said, do we even need a scale? You know, so. Let's just do the ACFT and let the information inform us on what the standard should be. What's going to be the high and the low? So, and then we decided, no, we need a scale. You know, we just always got to grade ourselves on what the scale is going to be. So there's got to be a standard. So we implemented a standard, and then everybody gets wrapped into that. So we're gonna, we got to look at the information, we got to open it up, and then, then we can determine exactly where the bar needs to be. Do we have it right? Um, but we've made adjustments, and I'll let uh, one of these two, Trey, our, our Sergeant Major, talk about the adjustments we've already made. I'll talk uh, real briefly about some of some of the things that we've seen with uh, the uh, pilot that went on with the 63 battalions. Um, the the number one exercise, the number one event that is is hurting the Army right now as a whole is the leg tuck. It is, and it goes back to what I was talking about with the uh, the core exercise. It is the leg tuck. It takes one leg tuck to pass, one leg tuck to pass, and we have uh, a large number of soldiers that cannot pass the leg tuck. Um, a lot of this is, and again, it goes back to you know you can't compare this to the sit up of the APFT because it measures a completely different uh, muscle group within your core. Um, but there's some other things that are measured with the leg tuck that we haven't measured before also, such as hand grip, uh, such as arm strength. Uh, we've always instituted pull-ups in a uh, ad hoc type of exercise when it comes to physical fitness, but it's never been part of our test 
uh, with the APFT. Um, and some people have not done push up, I'm, I'm sorry, have not done pull ups. And those are some of the exercises that uh, some, of the, some of the muscle groups that are used in those exercises with uh, hand grip and uh, with pull ups that uh, contribute to not being able to do a leg tuck. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into this, but I'll tell you the leg tuck is, is the biggest one. So for, for soldiers that uh, are small in stature and don't have a, uh, a, a upper body strength that uh, can pull sustain themselves during uh, one or two pull-ups, consecutive pull-ups, even three pull-ups, uh, the leg tuck is going to be a challenge. And I would suggest that you get on the bar now and you start developing that arm strength and that grip strength uh, in preparing for the leg tuck. Sergeant Mitchell. All right, thank you so much. I'll, I'll just want to add one, one piece to this. The 63 battalions that we have testing in the first phase of this right here, you have to realize that so the 63 battalion, they all was untrained. We just came out with an Ahmed Combat Fitness Test because we know that it's trained the entire body to where you used to do push-up sit-ups from two-mile run. And we came out and we said, hey, two of the events are the same. Push-ups and the run is still there. All we did, we cha added, changed one out and added three of them. But the bottom line of fun is guess what? There's an untrained force that we gave this test to for the first initial phase of it. Mm -hmm. So guess what's going to happen? Uh, did we expect for some people to actually fail? Absolutely. Because nobody has trained on it, just like Samaj and Army said, and just like uh, Samaj Gooden said. You have to train for the test you want. And you cannot go out and just say you're going to just do it like in two days and get ready for a PT test. You have to continue to get in the gym, or you have to get out there and use equipment if you don't have it. I set up two, two sessions with the most senior leaders across TRADOC, and that's every nominative sergeant major and general officer. In the session that I set up, we did not use the equipment that we have for the ACFT to get after the same movements that you would have to do for the Army Combat Fitness Test. And guess what? Every last one of them went through it, and it was challenging. But guess what? You can do the same thing out there. Are we going to sit up and get better? Yes. Do I think that the data might change the scoring? Absolutely. Because today, you got to understand, we're on a test in 63 Battalion. We're going to start 1 October, and now we're going to start testing the rest of the Army to where you're going to look at it. Active duty Army is going to take two diagnostics, and you're going to have the Army Reserve, the National Guard, is going to take one diagnostic. With all of that data coming in, it's going to validate what we're doing and making sure that we got this scoring criteria correct. So why? We need the data to come in. We need everybody out there to guess what? Hey, ain't no need to talk about the ACFT. I just need you to talk about how you get out there and start training for it. <laughs> yeah, I want to read it. Do one more readdress on this is, you know, don't take um, what I said as, you know, the standards may become easier. <laughs> they may become you know, more stringent. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what we've already looked at with the black group. <clears throat> it was 180 for the minimum for the uh, the three rep max uh, deadlift. <laughs> and over the data that we've received, now we're saying it needs to be 200, mm -hmm. 200 pounds. So we've increased the standards on some of those things based off the information that we've seen. And we can see that. This is going to be a hard combat fitness test. We need to change fundamentally how we train our bodies for combat. That's why it's called the Army Combat Fitness Test. So when we, uh, when we say we're gonna address those standards, we are gonna address them. It doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna become easier but we just need to evaluate where those standards can be. The goal, the ultimate goal is actually over time, we raise the standards because we've trained our bodies the appropriate way and we're seeing our fitness levels become better over time for everyone in the Army. Talking about some of the events uh, in the test, we got a, a couple of questions. I'll try to put these together so we can get a good answer. Uh, one, why is the two-mile run still a part of the test after adding additional exercises? Is there a reason we can't do a one-mile run? And with regard to the, the deadlift, is there uh, an, any chance that we're going to be allowed to wear a lifting belt to prevent back injuries or gloves for better grip? And finally, is the walking 10 an alternate event? The what? Walking what? The walking, walking 10. 10. I'm not sure they didn't clarify that, but... So hopefully they'll come back and uh, oh, clarify sorry. the yeah. walking team. We can understand the question. We can get you a good answer. <laughs> okay. But on the first two? Yeah. Okay, I, I'll, I'll address the part about uh, the two-mile run. Could we do a one-mile run? Yes. We can also do, you know, half a mile, but we're not going to. We're going to do a two-mile run, and some people would say, well, scientifically, 
you know, I can test, you know, cardiovascular endurance maybe with a one mile run. And I acknowledge that, but we're going to do two miles and because let's just, let's see how we do. Let's, let's gut check. Let's, let's go out and assess ourselves. And after those six events, can I maintain a two mile endurance run? And we're not going to go back to a one mile. It's going to stay a two mile run and it's going to, it's going to test your endurance. And do you have the ability to, to kind of, I think it's a little bit of a mental capacity to kind of force your body to get through that event. So it's going to stay a two mile run. Uh, the, the, the second part of that question the referred weight, to uh, weight equipment. Yeah, the weight, the weight belts belt. gloves. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, <laughs> gloves, gloves are going to be authorized based off of, uh, you know, the, the physical fitness uniform. So um, that's not changing. Uh, if, if somebody's asking if they can have specific like uh, grip gloves or workout gloves or, or uh, you know, the gloves that, that most uh, common uh, weightlifters use with the fingertips cut off, that's not part of the PT uniform, so that wouldn't be authorized. Uh, and as far as the belt goes, there is no additional equipment that can be used when taking the uh, ACFT other than what I just kind of described already with the, with the approved uh, Army policy on, uh, on, the, on the fitness uniform uh, as per uh, temper, temperate weather and, and, and so forth with gloves and, and hat and, and uh, the uh, uh, in, improved physical fitness uniform. Um, I'm sorry, not IPFU, APFU. Uh, so that's basically what you have. You're not gonna, there's not gonna be anything else. Uh, so, um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I never yeah. saw anybody wearing a, a weight belt yet yeah. uh, or trying to wear it. Now, one thing, one thing that we can address off of yeah. this is proper form. And Sergeant Major Mitchell did talk about this already also. So somebody would, somebody would think about having a, a weight belt so that they could uh, prevent injury and, and, and that sort of thing. So with, with, as we develop this, as our NCOs get uh, more knowledgeable, as, as uh, uh, the formations out there uh, get more reps un uh, under their, their belts uh, as they get more reps on, on, on administering it, on NCO supervising, supervising it, on ad ad administering the actual test itself. Um, you are going to see soldiers become more uh, comfortable with performing some of these uh, events. Now, uh, you would use a, a weight belt in doing the max deadlift. We have a hex bar. I'm not going to say that the hex bar is a, a bar that is going to prevent injury, it's dummy proof because you can still get hurt doing it. However, if you're doing the max deadlift with the hex bar, uh, it, is a, it is a pretty safe and desi designed uh, bar for making sure that you have the pro appropriate uh, uh, position when you're getting ready to uh, do the deadlift itself. Uh, and again, that's what, that's what the graders are there for. That's what the instructors are there for. That's why they've been, they, they, they know to look at your knees to make sure that your knees are not going to buckle in when you're getting ready to uh, exert the energy to lift up on the, uh, the weight of the max deadlift. Uh, and there's other key things to look for also when it comes to that. Uh, but you know, the other thing too is the knowledge about how these things work. Uh, and you know, for instance, the, the max deadlift is not necessarily about lifting, it's about pushing with your legs to get that weight up off the ground. Exactly. The minute that you think about lifting is when you can, uh, when, when that, uh, that energy can get uh, uh, proportion to your lower back and that's when the injuries can happen. So it's about understanding how to use your muscles to lift up on the weight, uh, I'm sorry, to push down on the weight to lift, actually get it up off the ground versus using your lower back. Um, but yeah, so no, no weight belts. Good try. The only thing I would add to it is it's almost the same thing you have for the Army Physical Fitness uh, Test. Is if a medical doctor prescribes something to you, say you have to have, like most people have these knee braces and ankle brace that they want to wear. If a doctor said that's what you need, then that's something that, guess what, you would, you made the authorized use. But I guarantee you, a doctor's not going to tell you you're going to need a weight belt. They might give you something else, but it won't be a weight belt. Next question, if a soldier becomes delinquent during the 12 month period of non-record testing, what's the way forward? Uh, are they flagged? Are they barred from reenlistment? I'm guessing the question is if they fail the diagnostic, what's gonna happen? Uh, it's just a diagnostic. That's what normally happens with a diagnostic APFT is normally nothing happens. So the Army regulation says it's a diagnostic. Therefore, there would be no flagging actions. There's no guidance. 
if a soldier doesn't pass the ACFT, that's, they still have to take the APFT. So everybody should take the APFT one last time for record in October or November or when it's appropriate. And that will last for one year while we're going through the test of taking the ACFT. And if a soldier doesn't pass the ACFT, then there'd be no action because the APFT is your valid record uh, for record, a physical fitness test for the Army. Well, that makes total sense. Uh, with the ACFT going live October 1st, 2020, and the next Master Sergeant Board being in November of 2020, will we have time to get a four record ACFT uploaded before the board convenes? <laughs> uh, it, uh, that normally depends on your unit. So again, if you've got a valid APFT for record, and then we go live on 1 October of 2020, all those records aren't immediately wiped clean. That's, we've never done the APFT that. We never just said, okay, you're good on, on 1 October. And some people don't ta take it on that day. If you have a valid APFT, there's gonna be a period of time that you have to take the next four record APFT, just like in the past. Uh, if that goes out of tolerance, then whatever the tolerance is, you need to be within the tolerance for and the guidance for that board. But, you know, we're not going to immediately on 1 October 2020 just unvalidate all the the APFTs unless you get and, something else. And, and when it comes to uh, when it comes to the, the window that you're referring to it with the uh, with the board and the start of uh, FY, uh, this was uh, this is for next year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So. Uh, you know, at the end of FY20, uh, the beginning of FY21, um, there's there's nothing that's going to stop unit leaders and commanders and for those those type of people that write reports. There's nothing that's going to stop them from adding into an NCOER or an OER about how well you did uh, on on that uh, on that ACFT that was a diagnostic. Uh, if and as may already alluded that you know the the APFT is already going to be on record and it's not going to be just completely wiped away because we started one October. Um, so I mean there there is still a way if that's what your concern is to you know how do you get uh, uh, I don't know maybe, maybe you're going to be the next 600 and you want to make sure that that's uh, annotated. Uh, so you know it can always get put in your NCOER and uh, we'll make sure you get kudos for that. Yeah, and, and this this goes back to those same 60 regulations that we kind of have to update. It, because in the regulation right now, it references, you know, are you getting a 300 on the APFT? This is how many promotion points you got to get. And it goes back to that. So we, get, we, we still have to update all that. We have to get it out. What's the system, rec system record currently used DTMS? Putting an ACFT in the DTMS. Right now, the scales, I don't think they've got that updated yet. So that's another one of those things that the regulations we got to work out. So, um, you know, more to follow. It's going to, you know, we're not going to flip the switch and everybody gets wiped clean. You know, one October, one November 2020, if you didn't take an a the new current ACFT in that, that 30 days, is that going to prevent you from going to the board? Um, that's one of those things we're going to work out, but I'm going to assume we're not going to just wipe your slate clean. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if a soldier fails in his or her group, like black, silver, gold? Are they going to be allowed to test in a different group, or how is that going to play out? So, again, we, we're still working on what the policies are. Currently, if you don't pass your AC, APFT, you would be flagged. Um, if you do pass your APFT and you have a permanent profile, then and you're allowed but you can't do certain things within your MLS, you would have to reclass. But again, that goes back to those policies and regulations, as, and that's why we need the year to inform us on where we're going to have to go with the policies. Are we going to, if you fail the APFT, you would be flagged. If you fail the ACFT, at some point you're going to be flagged. But you're saying if I don't meet the, the gold black standard, and, but I still meet the gold standard, you would just stay in your MOS. That's one of those policies that we're going to have to determine at some point. Mm -hmm. Are there any thoughts to adding instructions on how to grade the ACFT into the NCO PDS curriculum? That's a good question, since NCOs are the trainers of the Army. Uh, well, honestly, at this point, no, we have not, uh, we have not uh, considered putting that into the POI for uh, NCOES at this point. Uh, 
you know, uh, our, our focus right now is to make sure that uh, uh, this past FY is to make sure that the 63 battalions had as much instruction and information as they could to be as successful uh, in getting us the data that we needed. And likewise, FY20 is going to be a, a really busy year when it comes to the ACFT piece of it, uh, as, as everybody has alluded to already. Uh, it's, it's essential that, uh, that we lean forward and we get as much accurate data uh, so that, uh, you know, when SMA and the secretary and the chief uh, are um, up to make decisions on some of these things with the policies that need to be adjusted, uh, that they are informed with the best uh, up-to-date information that they can. Um, that's not to say that, that that wouldn't happen in the future with implementing something like that into, uh, into NCOES. But, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily need to do everything all right now. Uh, right now, the focus is to make sure that every single soldier does their very best at doing, performing two ACFTs uh, six months apart within FY20. That's really all that uh, the entire Army needs to be focused on. Uh, the leadership that's responsible for certain headquarters and, and oversight and with the Army senior leadership, um, they'll be the ones that make sure that, uh, you know, all the right decisions are made. Uh, and if need be, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with the, the Commandant out the Non-Commissioned Officer Leadership Center of Excellence and with the other centers of excellence uh, with the NCO Academies, uh, we will come up with a, a process to implement uh, instruction, if need be, into the NCOES and into the NCOPDS uh, system so that uh, uh, all NCOs that are going through there understand how to do it. Uh, but again, that's not our focus right now. Our focus right now is to make sure that we are setting up everybody in the Army uh, with the best success that they can uh, to do the very best on their two ACFTs that, uh, that they're required to do. So, yeah. Major Mitchell, can you go over how do you get certified yeah. to test? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right now, how you get certified on um, SMA is that we have an MTT that comes out. And the MTT will normally come to your installation, and the team will get out there, and they will have 16 individuals that they teach at level three. Level three is what we're looking for is like your MFTs. If you have an MFT inside your organization, we would teach them individuals how to go out there and actually create level twos is the ones that can be your NCOICs and your OICs, and then your level ones is the ones that actually they watch them grade and test, and then the ones who are actually be the ones who are your evaluators. But just to add on to this, you know, we do have coming out of CIMT, we did give everybody out here a field testing guide that came out uh, September. 2018. We also gave you a call manual that came out that also had the ACFT in it, as well as we have the 7-22 that's right now is dated 1 October 2012. We got a new one coming out that's going to be broken down to where you can actually grab that documentation up and it will teach you and show you exactly how you need to grade, test, and evaluate every soldier that you need to test on the ACFT. Now all of that should be in place before 1 October 4 goes out across the whole entire army. Why? Because we understand everything cannot go into the NCO or PDS. We understand that. But we, as an initial military trainer, is going to make sure, since we are the proponent, that you can have a documentation in your hand and you can use, and you can see pictures. You know, a lot of people don't do anything with just words. You need pictures. So we're going to have pictures so you can sit up and say, this is how you grade, you coach them, you teach them, and you, and you evaluate them so they can make sure they're taking the, uh, the ACFT to standard. And everybody will have that inside of their hands to be able to do that, as well as you can also download it off of um, the CMT webpage. So, so three things to close out this mm -hmm. one is, number one, you can get trained on a train the trainer. Mm -hmm. As that rolls down, you get your organizations, you get your installation, you get trained the trainer. That's number one. And then number two is, do we actually need to take everybody in the NCO PDS and teach them as NCOs how to give the Army Combat Fitness Test as we go forward? We don't do that currently for the current APFT. We don't teach you how to grade the push-up, sit-up, or the run. That's a unit responsibility. And I believe as this becomes the 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 four record APFT in the next year, we're gonna have enough folks train the trainer and then it's a basic responsibility in NCO over time that we'll have plenty of folks that go through this. Once you get one or two reps underneath your belt, you'll understand how to do that. And it may not be necessary to implement this in the NCO PDS. Cool.
Got a, co a couple of questions coming in now uh, online, and they want to know what is the reasoning behind the six events? Why those six? And how does it make the soldier more capable, especially the two-mile run? And why did the push-up change? Okay. You can start. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, we had did a study. Um, and the study that we did, we actually went out and we used um, the BISPER, which is the baseline research study that we actually used. And what that actually did, it went out to test and see what we need to do. But the test that we're doing today is based off your warrior task and battle drills and your common soldier's test. What we did, we went out and found out what do a soldier need to do when they're in combat. When we started looking at that, that is what we based these the six events that we have today. And the reason being because the three-event PT test was not doing it. That's why you see a lot of individuals out there today that has a lot of back injuries and, and so forth. Because guess what? We sit up and we do the push-ups and sit-ups and three-mile run, two-mile run, but then we send you out to combat and we put you on with IOTV, almost 100 pounds on your back, and you never did anything to train your back, to train out your, to your total body. So that's what it was all based upon, is actually what are the warrior tasks, the warrior tasks that you would have to conduct in combat, and what body parts that you would actually need to strengthen up in order for you to go out there and make sure that happened. So that is what it came off, and that's what we use. So for the... Uh the, the reason that we adjusted the push-up uh, from the hand release push-up to the arm extension push-up uh, was primarily because of really it comes down to the core and the ability for soldiers to maintain uh, one steady line from uh, the base of their neck all the way down to their heels. And it really, again, it goes back to the, the strengthening of our core uh, as, it, as it pertains to being in the front leaning rest position. What we did see is that uh, um, Either, either because uh, they were already tired at doing it, but with the hand release push-up, when the hands were uh, directly underneath the shoulders, uh, and to raise them up, uh, a lot of times after they've been executing a few repetitions, the soldiers would start to uh, get a little lazy in that movement, and instead of raising their hands up to their shoulders, they would start arching their back at their lower back, creating the uh, gap that they needed in between the ground and their hands. Uh, and, and that automatically led to an improper push-up because then they would start leading with their shoulders versus a nice straight plank, a nice straight line that we uh, require. Um, and then uh, another reason uh, for uh, eliminating and not doing the hand release push-up uh, really came down to uh, the ability of a grader to be able to see most of our most of our fitness tests are done uh, early, in early morning hours throughout the in, most majority of the army and a lot of times those are in dark areas a lot of times it's on grass uh or or, or whatever type of terrain and sometimes it's hard to see exactly how much space has been uh, developed in between the, with the soldier raising their hand off the ground versus when they extend their hands out uh, you can definitely see that their hands are off the ground because there's not any way that they're going to be able to maintain that uh, um, uh, moving their hands out with keeping their palms on the ground. Uh, so that was that was pretty much uh, the two main reasons why we uh, went to the uh, eliminated the hand release push up. And, and I just want to make sure I make one one correction. I said BISPER. What it is is the baseline soldier physical readiness requirement study that we sent out for the Army, what actually came back and we tested the warrior task and battle drills that you was commonly used inside of uh, combat, and that's what came up with the Army Combat Fitness Test of what you need to do, which is based off your components of fitness that the SMA was talking about, the 10 components of fitness that you actually use and which one that we actually need to use inside of this. So that's what it was all based upon, and that's what we got our research and our data from to saying this is what the events need to come up with. And specifically, the last piece about the two-mile run, it's about cardio endurance in combat. And sometimes you're going to need, you need some speed and agility, and other times you're going to need some endurance. Mm -hmm. So we can't, you know, we could, you know, have you walk, you know, three hours and do a 12-mile foot march. But there is a level of endurance that needs to be replicated, and the two-mile run is the replication that we're using for cardio endurance that replicates what you would need to, to be uh, and do in combat. SMA, has there been any discussion on making the height and weight standards gender neutral as well? Not as of yet. Okay. 
got about five minutes left in our program, so we're going to try to get through as many of these questions as we can. Uh, the answers we're trying to get very detailed to make sure we give you the right information. So if we don't get to all of your questions and answers, we'll make sure that we've got folks posting online well after we're off the air. So keep pumping your questions in. We're, I'm enjoying reading these. These are fantastic questions. Um, I guess the next question would be, is it true that soldiers with permanent profiles must, at a minimum, achieve the gold level for the three repetition max deadlift, the sprint drag carry and two mile run? Does that mean you'll be on the gold standard regardless of MOS? So yes, we, well, I'll talk about the, the three events. We talked about the alternate events for the run, but the, if you have a valid permanent profile that prevents you from taking an event, you must take the three events that you just mentioned. You must do the three rep max deadlift, you must do sprint drag carry, and you have to do either the two mile run, the row, uh, the bike, or the swim that you have to do those three events. If you can't do those three events, you're not taking the ACFT, and that's not a valid ACFT. And as for the gold or the permanent profile mm -hmm. standards, yep. I, I believe that is correct. Okay, they're telling me we're just about out of time. Uh, for, for one last <laughs> question, I'll direct that to you, uh, SMA. Um, in your opinion, ACFT, good for the Army? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I think that's a fairly easy question. I think it's great for the Army. Um, I had to take it to be the Sergeant of the Army. So, um, you know, and that, that doesn't really define the question whether it's good for the Army or not, just because I took it, you know, as a requirement to become the Sergeant of the Army. This is really good for the Army. And I look at every one of those events that I do for the Army Combat Fitness Test, and I can have a direct correlation to some event that happened to me in combat. I've, I've had to lift heavy things, sometimes more than three times. I usually ended up in some kind of sprint at some point. <laughs> I was on the ground, sometimes because somebody might be shooting at me, I had to push myself off the ground and then go and sprint. And then sometimes I drug uh, some things along the ground and I had to pull or lift myself up to get over obstacles. So I look and I definitely had to have some endurance and some of the heat and some of the, the equipment that we have. So I really believe this is where we need to go for the Army. This is great for the Army. It's not just good, it's great for the Army to make sure that we have highly trained, disciplined and fit soldiers that are gonna win on today's modern battlefield. I think as, as you all know, if, if you wanna maintain your level of being the greatest army in the world, everybody wants you to knock you off. And so I think doing the same thing we've always done is not the right answer. In order to be the greatest army in the world, to maintain that level, we're gonna to need to change how we do our fitness. And I think this is great for the United States Army. SMA, I want to thank you for that. That was a great way to close this out. Sergeant Major Gooden, Sergeant Major Mitchell, thank you both for being here. Thank the three of you for participating this afternoon right here on the Army's Facebook Live. We're going to continue to stay online, even though we're not broadcasting anymore. We'll stay online to answer as many questions as we can. And before we go, I'd just like to say thank you to the United States Army Band Pershing Zone and their production staff for helping us this afternoon with the Army's Facebook Live. From Washington, I'm Hank Manitrez. Thanks for watching.